Mr. Grimsdyke was a garbage collector. He lived alone in a ramshackle house with only his beloved pet dogs for company. And since his wife died, he had been very, very lonely. He adored children, even though he never had any of his own. And he would collect all the broken toys that he found in the garbage cans and he would take them home with him. And there he would repair them and hand them out to all the kids in the neighborhood. He also gave them candy and he allowed them to play in his garden. And watching the children play made him happy. It made him feel less lonely. But one of his neighbors, Mr. Elliot, who lived across the street, couldn't stand Mr. Grimsdyke. He thought the house was an eyesore and he was sick and tired of listening to the noise of children playing and dogs barking. It irritated him so much that he was determined to drive the old man out of the neighborhood. One night, long after all the neighbors had gone to bed, Mr. Elliot sneaked into their gardens and he destroyed their flower bed. In the morning, he blamed the mess on Mr. Grimstock's dogs. The neighbors complained to the town council and the police came to confiscate Mr. Grimstock's dogs. As if that wasn't enough, Mr. Elliot pulled some strings and he had Mr. Grimstock fired from his job. Then he started to spread vile rumors about the old man so that all of the parents would tell their children to stay away from him. His plan was a success and pretty soon Mr. Grimstyke was all alone. Every evening when he had dinner he would put a picture of his dead wife in front of him and he would talk to it and that made him feel less lonely. He would say to her photograph, I don't understand it Helen. Everyone was so kind to me before but now this. I don't have a job. My dogs are gone. I don't have any children. I don't have anyone to make toys for. No one to keep me company. But then he would say, well, never mind, Helen. We've always got each other. And that's all that matters. However, mean old Mr. Elliot wasn't finished. He was determined to force the old man to move out. And he had saved the worst for last. On Valentine's Day, he brought a bunch of cards and he wrote horrible, insulting poems on them. And at the bottom of each one, he would sign the name of a child in the neighborhood. And when he was finished, he would put them in envelopes and he sent them all to Mr. Grimsdale. When he opened his mail and saw what was written on those cards, he was horrified. One said, a tree is beautiful if its owner prunes it, but our town isn't because your presence ruins it. Another said, some people live in the country, some people live in the town. Why don't you do us a favor, jump in the river, and drown. The cruel poems made Mr. Grimsdyke so depressed that he didn't have the energy to leave his house and all of the joy had gone from his life. He spent all his time indoors with no one to talk to except the photograph of his dead wife. Nobody had seen him for two weeks and the neighbors started to become curious. They knocked on his front door but there was no answer. Eventually they decided that they would have to check on him so one of the men broke a window and they climbed inside. He was shocked by what he found. Mr. Grimsdyke was found hanging by his neck. He had become so depressed that he had taken his own life. And they buried him in a cemetery on the outskirts of town. And the grave was right next to his dead wife. And all of the neighbors attended the funeral and the children. They placed wreaths on the coffin. Mr. Elliot was also at the funeral. And he stood at the graveside with a smirk on his face as they lowered the coffin. One year later, on February the 14th, just as the church bells tolled midnight, something very strange happened. The soil on Mr. Grimstyke's grave began to shift and move. A hand emerged from the earth, a rotting, decomposing hand, and something crawled out of the grave. Mr. Elliot was at home that night, sitting by the fire. He was writing a few Valentine's Day cards that he planned to send to some wealthy widows. And that's when he smelled a really foul stench. For the next few days, no one saw Mr. Elliot. And after a week had passed, the police came to check on him. What they found made them recoil in horror. His corpse was sprawled across his desk and his face and his body were covered in blood. There was a large crumpled piece of paper lying on the desk beside him and it read you were mean and cruel right from the start now you really have no and then at the bottom of the note wrapped up in the paper they found a bloody human heart this story is called shadows in the station and it's a story about a subway station in japan where a lot of people take their lives and it's based on a japanese urban legend i live in tokyo 
and I take the subway to work every morning. My local subway station is a notorious spot where people go to take their life. And over the years, countless depressed and misguided people have taken their own lives by jumping in front of the train. It became such a problem that they installed mirrors in the subway. And they say that if a person catches sight of themselves about to jump, it will make them change their minds. And I have no idea if it really works. But just last week, there was a suicide at the station, and I was there when it happened. I saw the whole thing. It was early in the morning, and I was waiting for my train, and there were only a few other people on the platform. I heard a voice over the loudspeaker announcing that the train was coming. Just then, I noticed a woman who was standing right in front of me. She was just an ordinary woman, about 26 or 27, but something about her made me nervous. She was acting very strangely. And as the train came closer and closer, she stepped forward and began inching towards the edge of the platform. Something was very wrong. She glanced back at me and I could see there was a look of sheer terror on her face. Suddenly, I knew what she was about to do, but I was powerless to stop her. I was frozen to the spot by fear. And all I could do was watch as she threw herself in front of the train. And then there was a screech of brakes as the train tried to stop. The other passengers on the platform screamed and through the echo of their screams and the metallic screech, I heard a sickening thump. The sight was so grotesque that I could not get it out of my mind. There was blood and chunks of flesh flying everywhere and I thought I was going to be sick. The other passengers, they ran away from the platform and I ran off with them. So the officials had to close down the whole line. And as we waited outside for a bus to take us to our destination, I kept thinking about that poor woman. The scene replayed over and over in my mind, but there was still something wrong. But finally, it came to me. The shadows. That's what had made me nervous. I noticed it just before she jumped. The lights in the subway were bright, and when they shone down, they cast shadows from left to right. The kiosks, everything cast a shadow from left to right. But the woman's shadow had been different. Her shadow went straight forward, stretching from her feet to the edge of the platform as if a light had been shining from behind her. There was definitely something wrong, and I had an uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach and it wouldn't go away. So as soon as I got to work, I went straight to the internet and I began searching for old news stories about the station. And there had been almost 20 suicides in the last year alone. Some of them were businessmen, some were housewives, some were old, some were young, and there were even a few children. Then finally, I found what I was looking for. It was a photograph that had been taken just seconds before a middle-aged man had jumped in front of a train. I zoomed in and I looked at it very carefully. One of his legs was in the air and he was leaning back. And I recognized the same look of terror on his face. There was a black shadow that looked like an arm and it was stretching out from underneath the platform and grabbing the man by the ankle. Suddenly, it all made sense. When I saw the young woman in the subway that morning, she wasn't jumping in front of the train. She was being dragged in front of it. Since we're talking about Japanese subway, have you ever heard of the legend of Teka Teka? Teka Teka is a grudge spirit, a vengeful spirit, and she is what is called an ondio in Japanese. The earliest record of possession by an ondio is chronicled in Japanese historical texts that dates all the way back to 797 AD. Ondio are the ghosts of a person who dies with intense emotion like jealousy, rage, or hatred, or they were victims of war, catastrophe, betrayal, murder, or suicide, and their wounds are indicative of how they died. They're mainly women with pale skin, long black hair, and after they die, they become a powerful, wrathful spirit who seeks vengeance upon anyone that is unfortunate enough to cross their path. And they can even cause natural disasters if it'll help them get their way. Their indiscriminate wrath is what makes them one of the most feared supernatural entities in Japan. Think of Samara from The Ring, the American remake of the Japanese version Ringu. The legend of Teka Teka dates back to the end of World War II. And one version of the legend says that one day at the train station after school, her friends decided to play a trick on her and they put a cicada on her shoulder. She was so scared that she fell off of the platform and she was hit by the fastest train in Japan and her body was split in two. In other versions, she falls and she survives, but she's unable to stand. So she's hit by a train, which then cuts her in half. 
and instead of bleeding out immediately, the weather was extremely cold, so it caused her blood vessels to contract, which left her in the kind of agony that the human brain can't even fathom. The station attendant heard her screams, but instead of rushing to help her, he was so shocked and disgusted by what he saw that he simply covered her body with a plastic bag and he left her to die. And as a spirit, since she no longer has the lower part of her body, she moves around on either her hands or her elbows, which are skinned raw from her dragging herself around. And she's often portrayed as having claws instead of fingernails or fingers, and she carries a scythe. And because of her horrific death, she lurks in urban areas and around train stations at night. You can try to escape her, but you probably won't be able to. Escaping her is impossible, even in a car. She can crawl as fast as 90 miles per hour. When she encounters a person, she chases them and she slices them in half at the torso, making them just like her. And in some versions, her victims become Teka Teka themselves. She's called Teka Teka because of the sound that her exposed spine and her elbow makes as she's dragging her torso along with her scythe. Another tale that has become synonymous with Teka Teka is that of Kashima Reiko. A few years after World War II, an office worker was brutally assaulted by an American GI and because she had been dishonored in such a way, she jumped off of a bridge and onto the railroad tracks and she was hit by an oncoming train. The impact was so forceful that her body was torn in half at the waist. And according to legend, three days after you hear this story, you will see the ghost of a woman with no lower half. She'll ask you the riddle either in your dreams or via phone from an unknown number. When she appears to you, she will ask you three questions. Now first, she will ask you if you need your legs. You must tell her you need them right now. Next, she will ask who told you her story. You must answer because she Mariko. Finally, she will ask you what her name is. And this is the most important part of the riddle. You must answer Kashima Reiko. Ka meaning mask, she meaning death, and ma meaning demon, mask, death, demon, and rei meaning ghost, and ko meaning accident, Kashima Reiko. If you answer her riddle without a mistake, she may just let you live. And if so, you may encounter her in a public restroom where she will then ask you where her legs are. You must say on the Meishin Expressway.